Well, it's time to resume looking for the worst comic book movie ever. I just realized there are two movies released this year that are eligible for this title. I should probably cover them before the end of the year so I don't fall behind. With Halloween so close, Hellboy seems like the best one to do first. Well, it could be worse. At least it's not a Marvel movie. Martin Scorsese says, I don't see them. I tried, you know, but that's not cinema. <laughs> A movie begins with a flashback for exposition purposes, which is cliche, but isn't automatically a bad thing unless this information becomes redundant if it's explained later in the movie, which it absolutely is. Ian McShane's narration gets the first F-bomb of this movie. The year is 517 AD, known as the Dark Ages, and for fucking good reason. Which is such a weak way to establish this movie's R rating, especially since we're about to see a woman get decapitated by King Arthur. Wouldn't it be so much better to play this as family friendly as long as possible than see a brutal decapitation to establish that R? The F-bomb not only adds nothing, but it doesn't come from any emotion and just comes off as Ian McShane saying an F-bomb just because they can. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could they didn't stop to think if they should. It's so cheap. I don't censor language in my videos, but I also don't drop F-bombs unnecessarily. It's not like I avoid it, but I don't pursue it unless it feels necessary. The narration continues, and McShane makes sure that when he says King Arthur, that we know it's the famous one. King Arthur. Yes, that King Arthur. Here, I was about ready to assume is his dumber clone. What? So he's an exact copy of you? Well, not exact. I have to remain superior, so I bred out some of the intelligence, made him sort of a simpleton, you know. I call him Bitch Stewie. Bitch Stewie, come here and meet my friend Brian. Hey there, Stewie. Oh, what's that? You got a friend? Oh, I'm always happy to meet one of your friends. Dear God. The narration already talked about Nimue, who is classically the Lady of the Lake and a noteworthy part of Arthurian legend. Granted, they take a lot of liberties with her here, but it is a name in Arthurian legend that anyone familiar with that will know. So they assume either A, the audience doesn't know what the name Nimue is from, or B, the audience needs to be reminded that there is a famous King Arthur. So essentially the movie assumes the audience is an idiot. Great way to start. Whoa. I have mixed feelings leaning towards negative about how this prologue is shot. The black and white is fine, but why the red? Are they saying anything here is important? Are they just throwing in a color like Schindler's List, but failing to understand why that movie did that? I guess she is the blood queen, but there is nothing else significant about the blood or her cloak here. So it's genuinely red for no reason. The whole prologue is at least very short, and we learn Arthur couldn't kill Nimue, and instead cut her up and spread her body all over the world. Still, it's better than being a Marvel movie, so Martin was kind when he said it's not cinema. He didn't say it's despicable, which is what I just said it is, according to Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> Next, Ian McShane gets some more exposition. Agent Ruiz is not your friend, he's someone you get drunk with. Three weeks ago, we sent Ruiz to investigate a nest of vampires. We haven't heard from him since. And we learn Hellboy is going to find one of his friends in Tijuana. We see here one of the solid bits in the movie, Hellboy's inability to not break his phone. It shows that he doesn't intend or want to mess things up, but he has a tendency to do it anyways. It intentionally shows how Hellboy almost never does things according to plan. It accidentally shows how this movie is a complete mess. We see Hellboy and we see his giant hand and it really makes you wonder, how does he take his coat off? Fortunately, the movie answers this for us. He takes it off between edits. Now we get a fight between Hellboy and his friend, who is now a vampire and seems to quickly be turning into Man-Bat. Hellboy accidentally kills him, reinforcing the idea that Hellboy isn't the most careful person. Overall, not a terrible scene. Hellboy drowns his sorrows before getting recalled to the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense. This is where we finally see Ian McShane as Professor Broom, who helps Hellboy shave his horns, and when he's done, he stands back and brags about how good Hellboy looks. Let's see what he accomplished. Nothing! Absolutely nothing! Stupid! You're so stupid! 
Anyways, Broom tells Hellboy that the Osiris Club have asked for help with giants. Before we can get to that, we have a brief interlude with two shadowy figures complaining about Hellboy, with one telling the other that Nimue exists and can be resurrected. We regroup with Hellboy as he meets with the Osiris Club, and they give him a history lesson in giants. None of it matters in the grand scheme of things, so we'll skip it. We also get a brief reason why Broom and this group don't seem to age, something we didn't even know was a thing until they introduce it right here. It's like having a murder mystery, but not knowing you have one until you're introduced to the killer. <sighs> what a twist! It's a great way to take Mystique out of the whole endeavor. This is where we get to Hellboy's origin, which features discount versions of familiar faces from Guillermo del Toro's 2004 version. We also see the Lobster, who gets to do some heroics and provides absolutely nothing to the plot. The Lobster is played by Thomas Hayden Church, who seems dedicated to making Spider-Man 3 the best comic book movie on his resume. Now take all this. This is where it's revealed that Broom was there with the intent to kill whoever came through the portal that Rasputin opened, which turned out to be Hellboy. We are just barely 20 minutes in this movie, and it's not what I would consider horrible yet, but it is pretty messy. We have Nimue, we have shadowy figures who hate Hellboy, we have the Osiris Club, we have Hellboy's origin, we have the Lobster, and we have Giants. And some of it is very loosely connected, but a lot of it isn't at all. The point here is that this movie is rough, but it's not completely off the rails yet. It is referenced here that Hellboy thinks Broom hasn't been the best parent. With patience and understanding, Broom turned that weapon into a force for good. Patience and understanding? You sure we're talking about the same guy? Yet we've seen nothing to indicate anything about their relationship that could be negative. This is easily an instance where showing is better than telling. And then we get the phone thing again. Oh, come on. Now we see one of the shadowy figures, and it's Man Bear Pig. I'm here to educate you about the single biggest threat to our planet. Maybe the end to the human race as we know it. I'm talking, of course, about Man Bear Pig. It is a creature which roams the Earth alone. It is half man, half bear, and half pig. Some people say that Man Bear Pig isn't real. Well, I'm here to tell you now, Man Bear Pig is very real, and he most certainly exists. I'm serial. Man Bear Pig goes to an abbey to get a piece of Nimue, which gives us a chance to get some incredibly fake looking CGI gore. After briefly being shown their weapons, Osiris and Hellboy go on the hunt to some incredibly generic rock music that you probably get off YouTube's royalty free music list. <laughs> If they're going to inject a rock song out of nowhere into this movie, couldn't it at least be a good one? It's gotta be back. Gotta get me on the track. Gotta track out of my back. Well, the good news is, at least this isn't a Marvel movie. The ghost of Orson Welles was resurrected through the use of dark magic to say one thing. That thing is, Marvel movies are a blight upon human existence. Afterwards, to return to the afterlife. That's just feckin' weird. But anyways, we see the group tracking giants when this happens. Yeah, seems like a perfect spot for an ambush. My thoughts exactly. Now, this moment is important to the movie. In fact, it's vital. They lure Hellboy out here with the intent to kill him. They stab him center mass in the chest with weapons that they think will kill him. Or at least I assume they think that, because otherwise why use them? And he seems hurt, but that's it. He survives and fights some fully grown giants after this. The whole scene just establishes one thing. Hellboy is immortal. Nothing can stop him. If nothing can stop him, why should we worry about Nimue? If this group who planned to kill him couldn't do it, what hope does she have? This movie has now established that its main protagonist is unkillable, with no cost associated with it, and no thought as to what this event means to the entire narrative. This movie is officially off the rails. We jump to Nimue getting some more pieces of herself and watching TV and her talking about evil generic bad guy stuff. A lot of guys ignore the laugh, and that's about standards. I mean, if you're gonna get into the evil league of evil, you have to have a memorable laugh. We get back to Hellboy, and we have the giant fighting scene, which really just looks like David Harbour on a blue screen. 
There really is no other way to do this, but could they try to make it look better at least? Everything has a very fake quality to it. The whole thing is done in a faux one shot, which would be more impressive if 90% of it didn't look completely and totally fake. Hellboy is picked up by Alice, who apparently he hasn't seen since she was a child. She is a medium who was told that Hellboy needed help by the deceased. This reunion doesn't last as Broom and some goons show up to pick him up. This is when it's revealed that Hellboy is upset that Broom went to the portal with the intent to kill him. I can't believe you showed up on Nazi Island all those years ago just to kill me. This is beyond stupid. Of course he planned to kill whatever came through the portal from hell. I think most would plan for that, but he clearly didn't, and that means so much more. I'm shocked Hellboy didn't know or at least come figure out Broom's intentions on that island. They make logical sense. In fact, the only thing Broom does on that island that doesn't follow logic is not kill him, which I would assume Hellboy is happy that happened. Let's give Hellboy some theme music for this moment. This is when we get introduced to Ben. I thought we were supposed to be fighting monsters, not working with them. And now Ben and Broom explain to Hellboy about Nimue and her origins, making the entire prologue completely redundant. We learn that the Osiris Club has a piece of Nimue. Alice decides she wants to go with them and get the piece, and Hellboy vouches for her, and Broom gives Hellboy a nondescript suitcase. It's quickly revealed to be a new gun for him. They go to Osiris and find that they are too late and the piece is gone. At least we get some practical gore, unlike the CGI crap they've been serving up to this point. This is when we are introduced to Alice's ability to puke up people's faces based on his CGI clusters. Bill, um... If you're gonna spew, spew into this. Shockingly, this is the best this effect will look in this movie. Hellboy gets a vision of Nimue, which goes nowhere. You know, everything is not an anecdote. You have to discriminate. And we are introduced to Ben's need to inject himself with some green serum. No, 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 I, I don't, that's, that's behind me now. I just, why are you buying? Now we get some origin for Alice, which involves Man Bear Pig disguising himself as Baby Alice. Hellboy gives Man Bear Pig a threat, and Alice is returned to her family. Hey, thanks for all your help. No problem. Why don't you go ahead and hit the easy button? Okay. What did I just do? Don't worry about it. This is the reason why Man Bear Pig hates Hellboy. I guess he was really dedicated to taking the place of Alice as a baby, but not dedicated to keeping a hold of Alice. I'm super serial! Nobody will listen to me but serial! Also, apparently Alice has lived in the same apartment her whole life. Oh my god, who the hell cares? Well, at least it's not a Marvel movie, though. Alfred Hitchcock famously said, In the 60s, Stan Lee was making these comic books that when I saw, I instantly thought, Wow, that would make a terrible movie franchise. You know what I would hate worse than that? Absolutely nothing. Smells like somebody shit in their cereal. Bung! Hellboy seems to have some sympathy for Nimue, which again goes nowhere very quickly, and Nimue is put back together. Ah, I always get this wrong. Ben leads him to the Bureau headquarters in Britain and leaves them. Ah, uh, he's an asshole. Hey, that's my joke. They meet up with Broom, who wants to research Nimue, and Hellboy apparently wants Broom to mourn the loss of the Osiris Club. You know, the group that tried to kill him? Won't he be happier knowing his dad doesn't cry tears for the death of his would-be assassin? This is just another excuse for Hellboy to be a jerk. We catch up with Ben getting a weapon to kill Hellboy because... I think we have to give that joke a rest, otherwise I might as well play for every character in this movie and make this video easier. Back at the researching scene. Then what? Mm -hmm. Then we make sure she doesn't come back for the sequel. Don't worry, the box office should stop that. Then what? Then the world will keep on spinning. And then... What? He's an asshole! Yeah, I still have some more asshole clips to use. So Hellboy proposes that perhaps if humans don't kill monsters, perhaps the monsters won't kill humans, which would hold a lot more water if we didn't see monsters throughout the movie kill humans whenever they get a chance. Hellboy confronts Broom about not killing him, and they get into a fight about it because they're assholes. What? No clip for that one? Lame. Hellboy tries to leave when an elevator kidnaps him. 
What a twist! It's actually a meeting with the other shadowy figure that Man Bear Pig talked to earlier. It turns out she prepared a meal for him and made it from human children. Oh, that's not right. No. I guess this is his reminder that as a general rule, monsters bad. He makes a deal to find out where Nimue is. He betrays her on the deal and she curses him. Oh my god, who the hell cares? Still, as bad as this movie is, at least it's not a Marvel movie. On March 6, 1999, Stanley Kubrick said, In about 10 years, I suspect there will be a thing called the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They'll make over 20 movies in 10 years, and they will all be the worst movies ever made. Worse than AI will be. And the good news is, I will suddenly die of a heart attack tomorrow, and will never have to watch one of those abominations. What the shit?! Anyways, Hellboy drops back in on Broom, who cracks a joke at him, without wondering how on earth did he just fall through the ceiling. This leads to a good use of licensed music. To my ben, Alice, and Hellboy go after Nimue. This gives a chance to get Ben's origin story. Origin stories are like assholes in this movie. Everyone's got one, and is one, pretty much. The heroes get attacked by zombies, while Nimue uses incredibly poor CGI to reclaim her blood. Once she gets her blood, she summons a collection of generic CG monsters. whoop de shit We get greed by her sisters, who are at the beginning, but I forgot to mention them because they are incredibly forgettable. And two of them die here immediately, so there is no point to two of them. Oh no, the movie won't be the same without, um, what's their name? Them, yeah. Hellboy attacks her, and we get more pro CGI from the lovely team at Industrial Lights and Half Assery. Meanwhile, Ben and Alice are still fighting the zombies when she discovers she can punch the spirit out of them. Things don't go well for Hellboy. Nimue quickly gains the upper hand for telekinetic powers that she apparently has now. She throws a twig of her crown at Alice when she pops up, and then she escapes. Ben then shows up and is quick to blame Hellboy for not stopping her. Congratulations! The Blood Queen has all the powers now. He's an asshole! The surviving sister tells the hero how they can help Alice, and then she is forgotten about. The characters of the sisters simply exist to keep the plot moving forward at this point. No other reason. She tells him of a cave where they can find Merlin. Merlin asks that he stop Nimue in return for saving Alice. Hellboy quickly agrees. The whole maybe monsters aren't so bad angle he was on really meant a whole lot to the story, didn't it? Merlin saves her, and we get a Ben ADR line clearly so we know it's something they ignored and the audience should ignore too. Should we be worried about where that's going? The movie actually has a lot of clear and bad ADR thrown in all over the place. Merlin knocks out Ben and Alice to tell Hellboy that he had a human mother that was a direct descendant of King Arthur, making him a direct descendant of King Arthur. This hits the audience out of nowhere. Never is it mentioned that Excalibur could actually be an option for them, and it's never even mentioned that perhaps Arthur's bloodline could be useful. It's just an art twist this movie presents you with without first setting up a mystery. Imagine watching the end of The Sixth Sense, except in this version of the movie, there are no ghosts, and suddenly you find out that ghosts exist and Bruce Willis is one all at once. It has a lot less impact and feels a lot more forced. That's this movie in a nutshell. Merlin presents Excalibur to Hellboy, who gets a vision of him using it to kill people and refuses to take it. Here's a much better idea than the descendant angle. Do what the kid who would be king does. The sword doesn't care who your parents are. It doesn't choose by birth or blood, Alexander, but by heart and mind. And said say you can only wield Excalibur if you're worthy. Merlin believes Hellboy is, but Hellboy does not agree. But, of course, we're talking about writing changes late into this train wreck. Anyways, we catch up with Nimue as she goes on a mass murder spree. Nimue attacks the Bureau and kidnaps Broom. Hellboy, Ben, and Alice rush over to a cathedral where Nimue is. Apparently, Man Bear Pig did some juicing between cuts because he's super ripped now. This leads to some fighting. Ben reveals he's a wear cheetah, which really begs the question, why is he a dick to Hellboy for being a monster? I guess you could say he hates monsters because a monster made him like this, but since he is a monster, wouldn't it also teach him that monsters are capable of not being evil? I'm clearly putting more thought into this movie than the screenwriters did. Let's go back to fighting. 
Man Bear Pig prepares to kill Hellboy, but Nimue kills him before he can. She drops Hellboy into Arthur's tomb and presents him with Excalibur, urging him to take the sword. I know she wants him to take the sword to urge him into starting the apocalypse, but if she miscalculates this, she will have given him the one weapon established to be able to stop her. She pulls Broom to her and kills him super quick. It probably should be this big emotional moment like in the 2004 movie, but instead it just seems forced and obligatory. Hellboy grabs Excalibur, gets horny, and this causes monsters to start attacking people nearby. Hellboy seems like he's gone full evil when Alice pukes up Broom's ghost, and we get what might be the worst looking effect in the whole movie. Anyway, he cuts off Nimue's head, tears off his horns, which actually reminds me of another movie. What was that one called again? Hellboy makes a head pun. <laughs> Lady, quit while you're ahead. No! no! Not a good time to lose one's head. That's not the way to get ahead in life. It's a shame he wasn't more headstrong. He'll never be the head of a major corporation. Okay, that'll do. Okay. Broom gets some final words, and then we cut to a scene with Hellboy, Ben, and Alice fighting bad guys to Motley Crew. Ben becomes aware of Cheetah, loses his clothes, then inexplicably regains them when he turns human. We get a teaser for Ape Sapien in a sequel that will never happen, and then we get to the end credits. This movie is just nothing more than a studio knowing they can make money off a of property, not wanting to pay Guillermo del Toro to finish his trilogy. For what it's worth, David Harbour does a good job. He's no Ron Perlman, but who is? This movie has some solid story ideas, but rather than let its story unfold, it just forces it upon the audience. No chance to really breathe life into the world, just constant twists with no setup. So is 2019's Hellboy worse than Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer? The answer would have to be yes, if for no other reason than it's a half hour longer and a much more muddled story. To summarize, this movie is a giant fucking pile of shit. That is one big pile of shit. Still, at least it's better than a Marvel movie. Terrence Malick said, I mean, we're all making a hidden life and one day dealing with all that existential philosophy of nature of man got a bit much. So he we went and saw Spider-Man Far From Home at the theater. It was great, although it could have used more Thor. Clearly, that's a misquote. Perhaps he didn't get the memo that famous filmmakers are supposed to bash on Marvel. And, uh... I'll go ahead and make sure you get another copy of that memo. Okay? Yeah, no, I, 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 I have the memo. I've got it. It's right. Hello. It's like, uh, we get a job done. It's like, I put on a happy face, but it just feels like, I don't know, it feels kind of... Pain don't hurt. Holy crap. I love you! It's like a dog, man. Okay. Wow. All right, that happened. They think order and chaos are somehow opposites and try to control what won't. 